So if I talk without a microphone, you can hear me, right? No? You can be all right, Joe, if I talk like this. Yes, you will. Thank you. Um, so it's the last one. Um, some of you are happy. Some of you are sad. I'm, I'm kind of sad. Um, So here we are. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks, and I'm kind of hoping and praying that, that, that maybe, just maybe, you all got some stuff out of these nights. Um, I know that the small group leaders and, and, and Taylor and I and Holly got a lot out of these nights with you all. So I'm really glad that we had a chance to do this. I'm glad we're going to continue to do it next year. Um, you know, and our goal this whole first year was simply to make you comfortable with being here and being comfortable talking about your faith. Right? That's all we really wanted to do. And we kind of hoped and prayed that maybe you all would begin to look forward to, to coming to Upper Room every other week as opposed to doing this at home or on the computer um, or in a different way. Right? And I think most of you have, at least my small group lies to me and tell me that they have. Um, so, yeah. So the other thing we, we found out relatively quickly is that maybe a lot of you did not know all that you needed to know about, um, about the Mass, right? The one thing that's basic to our faith. So you allowed Taylor, maybe during the weekly upper room talks, to kind of give you some Mass etiquette, right? I don't hear the, the, the kneelers go crashing down. I have to tell you, when I'm, when I'm here on, on the weekend preparing for Edge and I hear the kneelers come crashing down when I'm downstairs, I think, yeah... Our middle schoolers wouldn't do that because they know what it's all about, right? They have the respect. They have all that stuff going on, right? And as, as we realized that you needed to have a little more education about the Mass, you've allowed me to talk about it since January at, at Edge Nights, right? So I appreciate that. But I also know that through this whole thing, you've gained a new level of respect and maybe some reverence um, as to what's to be expected here. And I have to tell you, when I watch you all come up here on Wednesday nights, I sometimes see a lot more out of you than I do out of the majority of our parishioners say, so go home and tell your parents that. You know what Don said, when we come to Mass, we act a lot better than you do, right? Um, they'll yell at me, but that's okay. Right? So, you know, and I'm kind of hoping that through this whole experience, you've allowed yourself to become open to the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk a little bit about being animated by the Holy Spirit and how that looks and what that means. And just by watching some of you over the course of the year between here and Edge Nights, I know that some of you have been moved. You know, the thing that we need to understand, too, and some of you, who's in eighth grade? So, um, so we're, we're done with Upper Room. I see you for a few more edge nights, and then I have you, whether you like it or not, for a confirmation retreat, either in June or July. Right, and we're going to talk, what's that? It's two days. Mike, you'll make it. You can do it. You can do it. No, shh. All right, so we're going to spend a lot more time talking about the Holy Spirit. Eighth graders, you had a retreat last spring where we talked about it, right? Um, and as we go through the retreats, we're going to talk about it even more and more. And I need you to understand, even tonight, what the gifts of the Holy Spirit look like and how they work in your life. Um, you know, understand that they really can control, they should be your guide in life, right? Even through difficult times. So if we talk about being animated in the Spirit, we have to talk about the gifts. And I go back to the prophet Isaiah. Um, he listed the seven gifts that belong to the Anointed One, to Jesus, and, and are now shared with the Anointed One's people, the church, which is you all. Right? Um, and if you read Isaiah 11, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. See, these gifts that we keep talking about, and you hear me talk about it at Edge Nights, and you've heard Taylor and other group people talk about it at Upper Room, you already have them. You kind of got those at, at baptism. Actually, I think you had them even before. I have a feeling that God puts those in us at the time of conception, right? But you need to understand what these gifts are because they are your moral compass. They are the things that will help you sustain and live a, a moral life, um, something that maybe our culture doesn't seem to think so necessary. The Catechism says that these gifts are permanent dispositions which make man docile in following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So permanent dispositions really kind of means that these are things that you're going to understand and experience and use to make your way through life, 
right? You're going to be an adult a lot longer than you were a teenager or a child. Um, and you need to understand what these gifts are. So what are they? Do you know? These guys know. Um, so the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom. It's the ability to see God's plan and to have faith in him in all aspects of life. Understanding. It's the ability to comprehend the truths of God, right? You have to pay attention if you want to understand what those truths are. Counsel. It's the ability to discern good and evil and make good choices. We can all do it, but do we choose to do it? Fortitude. Having the courage and the strength to suffer for our faith and not be afraid to face persecution. I thought it was interesting. Father Mike did not see what I wrote to talk about tonight, but man, he talked about it all through his homily. Knowledge, having a deeper ability to see things as God sees them. Piety, this helps us to understand who we are in relation to God, and it leads us to be more humble in our lives and in our prayer. And you all could use a little more humility. We all could. And fear of the Lord, this is having fear of separating ourselves from him and being in awe of God and who he is. See, Jesus possessed these gifts perfectly, and we need to understand how he led his life, right? He was our example. Think about this. If you think back to Scripture, and we've read these to you over the course of the year. When Jesus was lost as a child, right, as 12, 12 years old, they were in Jerusalem, and the parents are heading back, Mary and Joseph are heading back with the caravan to Nazareth, and they realize Jesus is gone, and they found him in the temple and he was, he was sitting among the teachers and he was listening to them and asking them all kinds of questions. And everybody was amazed at this 12-year-old kid and his understanding of all things about scripture. His parents showed up and they were full of anxiety and they're like, what the heck are you doing? You know, he showed them the gift of wisdom by responding, don't you know I've got to be in my father's house? And see, nobody knew that he was God, right? So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are all kind of like, Phew. What is going on here? When Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman at the well, without having met her ever before, he had knowledge of her sins and he had the wisdom in how to lead her to a life of freedom. That's in John 4. When he was experiencing great agony in the garden, if you remember after the Last Supper, right? He possessed fear of the Lord. In fear of the Lord, he had a desire to do God's will, even when it was causing him such intense agony and a lot of pain. That's from Matthew 26. The Catechism also says, if you've been baptized, you have these same gifts. And when you're confirmed, these gifts are going to be strengthened in you. So eighth graders, here it comes. Let's break them down in a whole different way, right? Because you need to understand what these are. With the gifts of wisdom, with the gift of wisdom, excuse me, we're able to see our realities the way that God sees them. Think about this. With the gift of wisdom, we should no longer judge according to society's preconceived beliefs and desires, but as God would. See, culture wants you to believe and act and think a certain way. And you can fall to that, right? You can spend life in sin. You can fall to it or you can actually decide that, that you want to have that understanding and that wisdom and follow the will of God. Here's a good example for you. Maybe you're brokenhearted over a recent breakup, or maybe you've been over a breakup, right? But with wisdom, you end up realizing that, that that significant other who broke up with you did not really intend for your good. They did not have your best interest in mind, so you're better off without them. There's wisdom. You know, fear of the Lord. You could be an awe and wonder of God. You could be an awe and wonder of everything that God's done. Who's ever been to the Rocky Mountains? Colorado? No? So who's been, who's been skiing in the winter? And you look how beautiful the snow is, right? And how beautiful the ski slopes are, right? And think about this. How many people do you see standing there taking selfies with their selfie stick, right? And, and, and not paying attention to, to all this beauty of God, right? They spend more time picking the right Instagram filter to take this picture with. And then instead of enjoying everything that God has put in front of us. Fear of the Lord, Right? The fear of the Lord helps us to step out of our whole little self-centered, egotistical world and discover God all around us, even you too, Mr. Cake. Don't be shaking your head no at me. Um, the gift of counsel helps us to make important decisions, right? It helps us to advise others on important decisions. I know you've all been down this path, at least I'm sure some of you ladies. Someone comes up to you and asks you for advice, right? And you're not quite sure what advice to give them. 
All you simply have to do is ask for and pray for the gift of counsel. God will lead you. You know, have you ever listened to a homily? Have you ever listened to Father Mike up there and think, what the heck is he saying? Right? <laughs> or read the Bible and not maybe be quite sure what, that, what, what that, that whole passage meant? If you're struggling with that, just pray for and ask for the gift of understanding. God will help you understand it. See, we don't see these gifts active in our lives because we truly have not committed ourselves to be part of that tree, part of that vine, or part of that branch that's God. John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches and he who abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Those who live in the vine of Christ will produce gifts and produce fruits of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this a whole nother way. Look at some of the saints. I'm not going to give you too much of their stories because you're going to hear more about them later. But one of my favorites, not one of my favorite, one of the most impactful stories for me is a saint who was only 14 years old. Saint Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio. 14. He had a deep life a deep prayer life and a deep devotion that led him at 14 to sacrifice his entire life to defend his Catholic faith. Even when he was faced with death, right, he took joy in the prospect of going to heaven. His parents were there watching what had happened. Imagine the self-control and the faithfulness he's got to he had to possess to make such a sacrifice. St. Maria Goretti, she was 11 years old and she died a martyr for chastity. See, she refused the advances of a, of, a, of a much older man, right? Because she deeply valued not only her purity, but his as well. You can find these stories online too. She suffered a very painful death after being stabbed nearly 14 times by him because she wouldn't accept his advances. Yet still, she forgave her killer before she died. Think about that. Wow. Not only was she chaste, but she was good and she was generous. Then there's St. Agnes. She was 13. She was a beautiful young lady, and she was also from noble blood, right? So all these men really wanted to, to be with her and to marry her because they wanted to be part of that nobili nobility. But see, she had this intense devotion to her faith, and she wanted to remain a virgin for the kingdom of God, and she showed very little interest in all of these men who pursued her. So these men, because they were upset with her, reported her to the Roman authorities and told them that she was a Christian, they wanted her to renounce her faith, and she refused to do it. So the Roman authorities had her stripped naked and dragged through the streets of Rome and taken to a brothel where they expected that men would have their way with her. But see, when she got in to the brothel, she still would not renounce her faith. And any man that tried to have his way with her was immediately stricken blind. Roman authorities still pushed her harder and harder, 13, to renounce her faith, and she wouldn't do it. So they eventually tried her in court and they sentenced her to death. And they tried, they, actually they tied her to a stake and they tried to burn her. But every time they lit the fire, she would not burn. Wow. Eventually they took a sword and killed her with a sword because God protected her in every other way possible. These are teenagers. 13, 11, 14. Right? Now am I asking you, do I want you to go out there and, and suffer persecution and die for your faith? No. I don't want you to do that, right? Um, but what I want you to think about, right? Think about this. Every time we go to Mass on Sunday, we're, we're, we're really displaying our faithfulness, right? We're displaying what God wants from us simply by going to Mass. And think of the example that you are to other people when you come here to Mass on Wednesday nights. It's pretty big stuff. Um, maybe you decide to take time for silence and prayer and you give up sweets. Or maybe you don't listen to music in the car, right? And you display self-control through all of that. It's not fun, but it works, right? And it's us showing God that we care. When we listen to a friend complain about matters that we think are trivial, which is probably most of them, but we're showing patience and we're showing goodness, right, to that other person. When times are tough, we help somebody else feel joy, right? We try and make them happier. Um, you know, when we were moved to maybe help a homeless person, help a friend, some of you are going to, to Mission for Mars with me next week, right? Maybe you help somebody who's sick or in need or you donate money instead of buying that morning coffee or that weekend coffee at Starbucks. That's called practicing charity. 
switch and we'll show you one more way that maybe you can understand what these gifts are. So I was thinking about my own life and when I realized that I understood the gifts. So the first one I told you was wisdom, right? I finally realized that if I surrender it, simply surrender it all to God, and when I stopped trying to take control of every aspect of my life, man, it changed and I had wisdom as to what that meant. Understanding. It started to happen in my life when I decided to, that my faith life was as important as everything else that was going on and I started to pay a little bit of attention to it. I started to read a little bit more about it and understanding what God's will was for my life. And then there's counsel. I told you before, this gift came alive in me when I decided to discern what was good and what was evil and make right choices. See guys, that's not that hard to do, but nobody wants to do it. Easiest one for you guys to control, nobody wants to do it. Because culture and everybody else are gonna tell you to do things differently, right? They're gonna tell you to act and be a certain way if you wanna fit in. You weren't created to fit in, you were created to stand out. And then there's fortitude, right? God helped me to realize what fortitude was when I realized that he was present in my life. And then when I had the courage and I had the guts to say what I believed in and not be afraid to share it with others, I understood fortitude. Knowledge, understanding God's word. Heck, simply, simply understanding the Ten Commandments has allowed me what, to understand what God wants for my life. And if you guys do nothing else but begin to understand what the Ten Commandments are all about and use those to live your life, you've gained so much, right? Piety became real to me when I decided to pursue a relationship with God because I've tried it enough on my own, right? And here's the thing. To do that, you got to put away your ego and you got to put away all that pridefulness and put yourself in service to others. You cannot be first. And the fear of the Lord. You know, the more I lean on God, the more I rely on him and his presence in my life, the more I fear of what kind of life that I would end up leading if he wasn't here with me. The Catechism reminds us that by the power of the Spirit, God's children can bear much fruit. He who has grafted us onto the true vine will make us bear the fruit of the Spirit. And the more we renounce ourselves, the more we walk by the Spirit. So see, the big deal is, is it all about you or is it all about everybody else? Because I told you before, I hate to tell you again, oh, and it's not about you, buddy. I wish it were, but it's not, right? Guys, it's not about you. We weren't put on the face of this earth for us. There are seven billion of us here. We were put on the face of the earth to serve everybody. You're not going to understand it. You may not believe it, but hopefully in the next six months we'll get you to believe it, right? But the Holy Spirit is vital to your life. You know who God is. You know who Jesus is. But the Holy Spirit only comes alive to you if you allow him to work through you. He's given you the gifts and the fruits. You know, what are you going to do with them? And we're called to renounce this life that we live now, right? So that we can be grafted to that tree, to that, to that vine, so my prayer for you is to take what you've learned this year and maybe put it into use at least a little bit over the summer. I can promise you that Taylor and I and the small group leaders will be praying for you all summer, right? To be who God has called you to be, not who the world wants you to be. And I only ask you to do one thing for me. Just listen for his voice, right? Because it's there. If you allow him in, you're going to know. All right.